Hello, my name is Matt Foy. I'm a retired salmon habitat restoration biologist, and I worked for fisheries and oceans for 35 years, undertaking salmon habitat restoration throughout BC, but I specialized in the latter part of my career in southern coast coastal British Columbia. I was involved with a number of projects on the colony farm, which we'll be talking about today. The first project that I was involved with in the design and construction was a project called the Sheep Paddocks, and it was done in 2002. It was effectively changing an old uh, field habitat into a tidal channel for use by salmon. Um, and a second phase was done in 2008. And then the last project I was uh, involved with was a project on what's called the Wilson Farm which again is an old field habitat, and it was involved with a compensation site related to the expansion of the Portman Bridge and Highway Number 1. So what we're going to be talking about today is there is a discussion on uh, the values of those salmon habitat restoration projects, that they provide value to, as expected to both fish and wildlife and other park users. And looking again at other areas in the park, particularly the Wilson uh, farm portion uh, for future potential fish habitat restoration projects, particularly directed at salmon. But I thought I'd start out uh, with a picture of one of the juveniles captured at the sheep paddock project when we were doing the initial assessment. And that's a young rainbow trout, likely an andromus form that we locally call steelhead. Uh, so these species also use these tidal channels seasonally in, along the lower Coquitlam River and in this case in the newly constructed sheep paddocks channel. So this is just an aerial picture of the area of interest just to orient us all to what we're talking about today. Through the center of the picture you'll see the Coquitlam River moving from top to bottom and just off the slide is its confluence with the Fraser River. Uh, the project that I mentioned, the Sheep Paddocks project, phases one and two, I've just circled in yellow. So it's more on the western side of the river. But again, this portion of the Coquitlam River is affected by tides. The Fraser River is tidal slightly above Mission Bridge. So the tides here perhaps have, have a variation of up to one meter between high and low tide. And this is important on how these habitats were designed and how they function for fish and particularly juvenile salmon. <clears throat> so for contrast, I've outlined in white the Wilson farm. And you can see just by scale, it's a very, very large piece of land compared to the sheep paddocks project. And we'll talk a about the previous work done on the Wilson farm. And because of the large size of this, uh, this field, there's numerous opportunities for further works of fish habitat restoration if uh, it is decided the values are uh, high enough to uh, justify disturbing the old field habitats that has values for many other species, particularly birds and particularly raptors. And we'll talk more about that. So this is just a shot of a typical field view of the Wilson farm. I think we're standing roughly in the center of the farm looking toward the north. Uh, that's Mary Hill off to the right and the power line right away. You can see there's large open areas dominated by reed canary grass, but there are patches, I understand, of other uh, grasses like sedges and perhaps other types of grass, perhaps specific air grass that are common in estuary environments. If you look in the background, there's a, a linear structure that's often ditch lines. This was used for agriculture. So the ditches were uh, used to drain the lands to make them useful for growing crops. And along those ditches, often uh, shrubs established themselves. The ditches had been dug out, the soil was exposed, and often that was a chance for a shrub to germinate. Many of the shrubs, if you look in the background, I've noticed uh, quite a few are actually red elderberry. So we'll talk more about the types of shrubs in this area. They form what is similar to hedgerow habitat 
and then periodically throughout the field you'll see clumps or even individual plants where other uh, shrub uh, shrubs have become established in the field so it's this mixed bird habitat open areas for species like raptors to hunt voles that pacific voles that do very well in these open field old field habitats and that's uh, a good part of our discussions in terms of design of fish habitat projects how can they be compatible with these other uses of this landscape so this is a picture of a typical water course on the wilson farm today it would have been a constructed ditch that was put along the edges of fields to drain them this is quite a low piece of land elevation low elevation and these ditches were necessary to keep the agricultural fields productive but since agriculture has been abandoned on a farm probably for 30 years or more these ditches have not been re-excavated and you can see over time in the for in the foreground is a very invasive grass called reed canary grass it creates almost monocultures and over time that grass can actually form floating mats that will bridge this channel over time the organics from the grasses and other leaf matter slowly fills the ditch in and it's progressing toward a wetland uh, feature that would have relatively low value for things like fish but even today you'll see the heron hunting presumably for both amphibians but also for fish it's likely stickleback will use this area year round and potentially uh, some monads may use it during the cooler part of the year now there's a feature other feature i'd like to point out that often these exposed banks uh, are about the only area that shrubs or trees can become established because reed canary grass is so dense it's hard for a small plant to germinate so you'll often see shrubs along the channel edges perhaps it was uh, established when that ditch was be was being regularly excavated or simply a portion of the bank fell in and exposed a small bit of soil and these shrubs become established now these types of wetlands are also very attractive to a species species uh, a very common species for these types of habitats which is beavers so I'll be talking a reasonable amount about bees, beavers and designing habitats to be compatible for be, with beavers in the area. So looking at this feature, you'll see there's a shrub involved and it's relatively healthy and it doesn't show a lot of beaver uh, activity. So I'm going to just flag that the surviving shrubs along water courses and colony farm give some indication of the species of plants that are beaver tolerant in other words the species that perhaps beaver aren't attracted to for food resources and perhaps do not use for dam building and these are the shrubs probably we need to consider when we're planting for wildlife but not wanting to promote things like beaver dams which creates issues in aquatic habitats in terms of fish access so what about salmon habitat restoration in the colony farm park? What have we learned? Well, this is a construction shot of the first phase of the sheep paddock back in 2002. There's a number of features that I want to point out. It was designed to be a tidal channel. So this perhaps is at low tide and you'll see exposed benches on either side of the channel. No, I'll talk about that a little in a minute. In the center of channel, what you can't see at low tide, it's roughly 1.5 meters in, in depth. And in terms of this channel, we found that beavers will not put dams in water of a certain depth. At some point, they do not dam these channels. And when you have a tidal channel, it relies on water coming in and then leaving a beaver dam changes the whole nature to a pond habitat, which is less useful to certain species that we're interested in particularly the salmonid species that use these these areas in the early spring uh, like chinook salmon and chum salmon so we'll talk about that the other features you'll notice that the uh, excavator in the background is taking the material from the uh, channel excavation is pulling it back and actually pulling it back quite a ways from the channel edge so unlike typical streams where we promote planting of shrubs and trees right beside the channel 
in these tidal areas, we know that they rely so critically for their freshwater uh, recharge on the tides. The idea of beaver uh, colonization and dam building really fundamentally alters and degrades the value of these areas. So all the spoil is being pulled back into a higher ridge and all shrubs and trees are being planted back there, primarily for bird habitat, not so much for fish values. So again, to separate somewhat from the aquatic, from, from the bird in this environment. And we'll talk more about the design. If you look at the benches, there's a number of plants uh, in the pots. These are sedges primarily, but there's other uh, brushes that were planted along the benches and the edges, trying to establish a more diverse um, a plant community than just a reed gary dominated uh, plant community. If you look on the left bank, on the far bank, you'll see there's an edge of grass. It's almost all reed canary grass before you see the shrubs in behind down along the rail line just to give you an idea of how dominant reed canary grass. Now I should say that bench in the first phase was not particularly successful in uh, creating a diverse plant community along the, uh, along the edge of the slough. And my impression was it wasn't wide enough. Reed canary grass is a relatively high grass. I like to say it's about uh, chest high by June 1st, and that grass leans over and shades. So you can see the bench is only about a meter, meter and a half wide. So a piece of reed canary grass on the higher ground behind can grow high and then lead over, lead, lean over and shade the shorter plants that we're trying to promote. So again, I'll talk a little bit later about phase two, where we pulled that bench back and made a long sloping bench up to five meters wide, trying to create this diverse plant community. And I think it is important to consider this when designing tidal channels for fish and wildlife values. So I pulled this uh, sketch, uh, series of sketches from my notes from um, when we had discussions about potential salmon habitat restoration on Wilson Farm around 2009. If you recall, the sheep paddocks project, which I had just discussed, was built during the period of 2002, and then a second phase in 2008. So a lot of what we had observed from those two projects were applied to this sketch. But the Wilson Farm was even more sensitive than the sheep paddocks uh, field for other values like birds, particularly raptors. And the concern was intrusion into this field had to be really, really careful not to disturb those other values. So just looking at this slide, the colors tell you uh, roughly the elevations of the field, the lands. So the darker reds are higher, the yellows are moderate, and the greens are lower. And I'm just looking at the uh, the elevations and it looks like greens are less than one meter in elevation and uh, by the time you get or orange you're 1.4 so you're getting higher and then of course the reds are perhaps as high as two so you'll see the straight lines are the uh, traditional ditches that were in the field so all this little sketch shows is potentially to use the ditches uh, these ditches that could be re-excavated and then various little dendritic channels could be excavated from the ditches that were more natural. But there is some features that I want to point out. These little round, the little round points are shrub uh, clumps. Again, not to, not to intrude in the field, which the openness of the field, I think, is what the raptor community wanted to maintain but to create some shrub edges for smaller birds uh, at the top of the tidal channels. However, I think I've mentioned from the tidal channels, the need for shrubs is not there. They, they create an opportunity for beavers to use them for both food and to create beaver dams, which is a problem. You also sound, see some round circles with a bunch of X's. Those are deeper ponds tucked off to the side that would be specifically designed for coho juveniles to spend the winter in. They typically will move from the active streams, like the Coquitlam River or the Fraser River, roughly around mid-September. 
So when you look through the notes, if you could read them, a typical tidal range might be from g zero geodetic up to one meter. And you can relate that to field heights based on, on the little sketch or the little uh, elevation table below. So the idea that this is what the normal tides would be in the Fraser River. So uh, the other feature is that I want to touch on is uh, key species off to the right. So it wasn't, these concepts weren't just being designed at the time for fish. They were trying to talk to these groups of species that people felt had particular interest or represented a certain community to be protected, conserved, and hopefully enhanced. Uh, in the bird, it was things like northern harrier, so the mar marsh hawks, like the open areas, and um, species like that. Also, short ear owls were mentioned because they're very rare and they use these open areas. Uh, and on the aquatic areas or even the field areas, the great blue heron. In the shrub meadows, the common yellow throat, red winged blackbird, tree swallow, American kestrel, barn owl. So, those sorts of species were meant to be part of the conversations design. The key mammals were actually the Townsend vole, which my understanding drives a lot of the raptor activity over the fields. And they do like the deep reed canary grass cover of the open fields. Now, from a fisheries point of view, which was my particular interest. Number one was Chinook salmon. And these are the small Chinook salmon that come in. It says March 1st to May 15th, but they come in the end of February and they last to about mid-May when the temperatures get become too warm from them. And studies have shown they're probably 80 to 90 percent from one single population, the most numerous Chinook salmon in the Fraser River watershed that spawn in the Harrison River. They come in at a very small size and they go from maybe 40 millimeters when they first come in and they want to try to grow to 70 millimeters before they head out into the more open areas of the Strait of Georgia. The other key species that use these areas are coho salmon. They typically will come in to looking for refuges from the fall floods. Somewhere around mid-September when the high pressure pattern uh, breaks down off the west coast and we get the rain trains coming in. Uh, these fish are adapted to seek out these slow muck bottomed areas for wintering and they'll stay in there as late as june 1st but similar to the chinook they'll be driven out by warm temperatures sometime uh, late april early may i think the peak uh, peak migration for smolts is typically about may 10th heading to the ocean so again these are cooler cooler times of the year for most of the summer months, some honors would likely not exist in, in the Wilson farm, even uh, naturally before development. So anyway, these little sketches, I don't know if you can see some of the notes, but this was what was proposed at the time. But all I can say is it largely did not happen, primarily because of the sensitivity of can fish coexist, fish habitat restoration coexists with these other values, particularly birds and particularly raptors. Now this is 2009, this is 2021. We've had more than a decade to look at the past works and make an assessment if those two uh, somewhat different uh, values can be uh, compatible. And I think this is the conversation we're having uh, right now. So this is what a Harrison River Chinook fry looks like. This was caught in the Colony Farm Sheep Paddocks Tidal Project. This one probably it has uh, grown a bit since it entered the area. They come out of the spawning gravel in the Harrison River, perhaps at 38, 39 millimeters. They move almost immediately down the lower Fraser and seek all these little tidal ch channels. And this one, I guess, is probably around 45 millimeters. So there's been a, a small period of growth. And it will double, double in weight and go to about 70 millimeters in these tidal channels before seeking the, the saltier waters of the Strait of Georgia. And these are the really small fish that are critically important uh, to uh, the fisheries 
uh, Chinook fisheries, particularly on the lower Fraser River, and that Harrison River is the most numerous Chinook population in the Fraser River. And don't forget, Chinook salmon gets in the news because they're a critical uh, prey species for the endangered southern resident killer whales. So Chinook salmon are a big deal in the Fraser River. So this is the other key species, key target species that I put in my notes for the Wilson Farm. The, the Salmonid in the center is a coho salmon pre-smold. It's just starting to get some shine on its back. It still has its par marks, so that's uh, camouflage for living in freshwater. But if you notice the little glisten on his back, he's starting to silver up. So my guess is this fish was caught in March and would be thinking of migrating to the ocean in late April, early May. Um, but what is noticeable is most of the fish are not coho salmon, they're stickleback. So in the sheep, this was caught in the sheep paddocks. Again, stickleback likely and do live year round in the sheep paddocks, but coho salmon are only a seasonal visitor. So this fish may have come in a third of that size and weight in uh, mid-September the previous year to get out of the winter floods had spent winter growing and, and just hiding out in sheep paddocks. And then because they are slow water, muck bottom, very rich feeding areas, they grow very quickly when spring comes. So they get the critical size they need, the coho salmon, to get to smolt size. So they might enter at less than three grams, two grams in the fall, and they want to be around, around 10 grams by the time they migrate to the ocean to do really well. So this one looking, it looks about seven, seven grams ish. So it's going to have a bit of growth yet before it heads out to the ocean. But again, they're relatively rare when it came, can become stickleback, but they're a very high value fish, which has a lot of social, economic and ecological value. So during my career, I was involved in a lot of work in the Squamish River estuary from about 1999 right through the mid 2000s and it, it was a very sensitive area similar to colony farm but in this case there was not a lot of invasives so we worked very hard to try to put fish habitat features around existing vegetation and minimizing the long-term impact on that vegetation community so there's a number of features i just want to point out if you look to the side, the left side of this picture, you'll see a shrub group. So typically we would map out these channels uh, to go around all existing shrub, shrub communities. What you can't see at this picture, picture particularly, there was not just the shrub to be conserved, but there was a small edge of the shrub, these shrub um, uh, clumps, where there was a real diverse uh, plant community. Uh, then you had these not quite monocultures, in this case not reed canary glass, grass, but uh, sedges, lingby sedge. Um, so what we did was a very steep bank on one side, and that reduced the amount of material we had to spread out in the marsh, so steep bank. But the other bank was a much lower elevation, so it allowed wildlife to get down to the water's edge easier, or if it came down the steep bank, it could get out. But more importantly, that low slope bank provided uh, an edge for a more diverse plant community to establish. And then the material was spread out very evenly if you look behind. Okay, so this, this sort of design I want you to think about because we'll talk more about it on Colony Farm. So this is just an example of some of these micro habitats along the edges of uh, either shrub clumps or in this case, tidal channels, where you've got a really diverse mix of very interesting plants. You can see some shooting stars, there's uh, chocolate lilies, there's lily of the valley, there's uh, four or five different plants. And then to a large degree, the meadows are not monocultures, but they're dominated by grasses. Just the plant, the one shrub you can just see off to the left, that's actually uh, black twinberry, again, very common in these tidal channel areas and also in areas um, where beavers are present. The other thing to notice is this is low tide and the tidal channel is largely drained but not fully drained. So small Chinook fry uh, 
in fact, are quite happy in these tile channels. They look for a little bit of cover or they drop down to the downstream areas where it's a little deeper. And then when that tide comes up, you can see in this case, it looks like it comes up at least a meter at the site, maybe a meter and a half. In they come to feed in the edges of these grasses. And that's how the tidal channels work. They really critically depend on that tide coming in and out. And we don't want anything to impede that uh, daily flow, both of moving movement of fish, but more just as importantly, the movement of food items that feed fish on the outgoing tides, for instance, or high tides where fish can get into the, actually into the root masses of these plants and forage. So I just wanted to show this slide. It's uh, not the exact same view as the previous one, but it's uh, two or three years after construction. This is a fully constructed tidal channel in the Squamish estuary. If you'll see, it's a sinuous form. It followed the edges of the shrub line on the left. The excavated material was, was sloped at a very gentle slope on the right bank. And uh, no, no planting of new plants was done in the Squamish estuary by design. We felt there was enough uh, plant community seed bed to allow natural regeneration. And you can see it's come back in a very diverse community. In a perfect world, this would be Wilson Farm, but I know reed canary grass will be a challenge in Wilson Car Farm. But again, I think uh, by careful design, we can promote a more diverse plant community, which ultimately will, will benefit uh, other species like birds. So this is another shot I took uh, this year, 2021, of the second phase of the sheep Paddocks project at Metro Colony Farm Park. Now, if you recall, the first phase, which I showed uh, under construction, was built in 2002. Now, it was the same period we were working in the Squamish estuary. But over the, over the number of years in the Squamish estuary, we observed plant communities had deeper discussions about birds and plants and fish interactions. So by 2008, when the second phase of sheep paddocks uh, came about, new design features were put in, trying to promote more diverse uh, wetland plants along the edge of the fish channel. So where you see the people on the right, on that bank, uh, the bank was sloped at a much gentler slope. It was about a five or six meter uh, bench that was above the low water tide but largely inundated at the high tide, again trying to promote uh, a diverse plant community. Now on the left bank, it was a much steeper bank. So what do we see? We see uh, what you can see is there's a number of cattails uh, visible on both banks, but if you got closer, you'll see a much stronger representative of things like sedges, particularly woolly sedge and other less uh, common uh, wetland plants all along the right bank where this low elevation bench was created. So this is the uh, template that sort of evolved out of what was observed in the Squamish estuary works. We applied it to sheep paddocks to, uh, this is 2021. So uh, what it, you can do is 13 years after construction. So often we see pictures of habitat projects that are constructed um, pictures, you know, a year or two after planting, and they all look good. What you really want to do is go back to projects that are at least 10 years old, look at them, see what you like about them, see what you don't like about them, see how the designs affected things like the plant community, and then hopefully improve your design in future works. I think sheet paddocks too uh, is a good place to visit, and I bring others to visit and talk about how do we deal uh, with invasive reed canary grass, for instance, and try to create more diverse plant communities in and around uh, these areas. And then the second thing we'll be talking about, how do we create uh, shrub, healthy shrub communities and tree communities dealing with invasives like not just reed canary grass, but blackberries. And how do we have uh, beavers living in our wetlands, but not compromising their tidal uh, flows in and out. How do we design around that so the beavers can live, but they cannot dominate the habitat and change it too much for their needs to the detriment of these other values. So that's the challenge of Colony Farm, trying to get everything right. 
it's not going to be simple. And I think I'm going to talk about a little bit how we can use PastWorks to guide where we go in the future. And I think Colony Farm, particularly the Wilson Farm, is such a large landscape that just a common sense, uh, use the best available science, phase it over years. As, as I say in, in previous, uh, you know, nothing, it's not going away. We have opportunities in the future. So the idea of phasing it and doing different phases, I think we're going to learn a lot and hopefully we'll get a chance to do a future phase soon and we can apply some of these ideas. So back in 209, I showed you previous sketches trying to um, get by, uh, general community buy-in to do fish habitat work on Wilson Farm with this idea of targeting different groups of species, bird species, uh, plant communities, and fish. And at the time, there was not general support, particularly in the bird community, to uh, to intrude into Wilson Farm and change the landscape with those, those dendritic channels. So this was my second uh, attempt to uh, win over uh, advocates for fish habitat and bird habitat in the Wilson Farm. I simply suggested that we go back and re-establish uh, the uh, the ditches, the existing ditches, excavate them down so they drain the land, made it slightly drier, which should be good for species like voles, great canary grass, and other grasses should grow better, similar to an agricultural. But those ditches might be modified to be more friendly to small fish like Chinook salmon. And potentially other ditches excavated that uh, again drain the land, made it more productive for plants, which should have made it more productive for voles, those sorts of things. Also, we talked about taking the excavated material from the, uh, the ditches and, and potentially pulling it back and making ridges and higher areas in the fields, keeping it perhaps grasslands. Um, but these would be refuge areas for voles during the wet season. So the ditches would keep the field somewhat drier, but if you go out there now in the winter, often there's standing water throughout the field. For voles, it, would, it must be a challenge the winter, trying to find areas not that they're in water. So perhaps some refuge areas for voles were talked about. Again, it was a it was a very linear uh, uh, idea of channels. But again, from a Chinook fry, I just want to point out, uh, similar to tidal channels in nature, uh, they are just looking at the front end of their nose. They're seeing if there's food and cover. And whether it's a curve in a sinuous ditch or a straight ditch, it really doesn't matter to these very small fish. They just want to grow, not get eaten, and get out to the ocean. So again, this was trying to find a compromise to not affecting the landscape too much for birds, but to giving a foothold for young salmon, particularly Chinook salmon. So this is just a little constructed ditch along the salmon or where I live that's under tidal effect. But it would just give you a sense. This is what we're talking about. Harrison River Chinook can make you use of very small habitats. And you can see there's sedges along the bottom. And this would be low tide and the tide might come a meter higher. The idea of these relatively small shallow habitats are actually very productive for species like the Harrison River Chinook fry. Now we'll talk a bit more about the coho juveniles. They will want the deeper water, perhaps complex cover during the winter, but not for Harrison River Chinook, they don't actually need very large uh, water bodies. And in fact, they probably avoid large water bodies to a certain degree because large water bodies is where large fish live. So this is just a shot of a tidal channel, a small tidal channel in the Squamish estuary similar to the previous one that was a constructed ditch. Again, these are sedges, but it gives an idea. At low tide, there's a small amount of water. At high tide, there might be a meter depth. Uh, fish will come in on the high tide and for, forage in the marsh grasses. Most of the fish will move down into slightly deep, deeper water downstream. But this is very, very productive fish habitat for small, particularly Chinook salmon fry along the Fraser will also be used by chum salmon fry in the spring. So it doesn't have to be a large channel. And if you notice the shrubs in this case are set back from the edges typically. Um, I think the plants that I'm seeing, uh, you can see some Nooka Rose in bloom. Uh, uh, black Twinberry is very common in this 
part of the marsh. There is some red osier, I believe. But we'll talk more about species that seem to be able to be uh, exist near water bodies and not particularly damaged or used by beavers to create beaver dams. So, okay, so after those various concepts were passed by uh, different entities involved in the question, should we do fish habitat work on Wilson Farm, it was decided to proceed on in Wilson Farm. So a couple things. The most expensive part of the project was upgrading the drainage system through the perimeter dike to be fish friendly. So I would argue probably 80% of the funds invested was on these physical structure. So in the yellow square, you'll see uh, a dendritic channel and then the dike or road, but it's a dike there's a little pond beside the Coquitlam River and that's where the tidal gate is located. Now a little farther downstream was the historic pump house, the way they pump water out when the Fraser was too high, Coquitlam was too high, they actually pumped the water over the dike. So that pump house had the pump uh, rebuilt to be fish friendly. So if you're a little fish that wants to leave Colony Farm when the pump's operating, you can go to the pump and survive. Uh, in the yellow square, there's a tidal gate that allows the tides in and out uh, each day up to a certain point just beyond flooding the field. So it's set with a maximum elevation. So it does allow tidal movement. So that's something to consider. If you remember from some of the previous slides, some of the fields or portions of fields are below the high tide mark. So they would be fully inundated and it was felt that that was not desirable at the time. Now this may change. So again, looking at the yellow square, this is the majority of the physical channel work that was done, particularly targeted at these Harrison River Chinook Fry. So there's little dendritic channels, somewhat similar to the sketches, but very limited in geography, didn't pursue very far. The other design feature that I think was not particularly good for these species is most of these channels that were excavated were quite deep and wide. And the Harrison Chinook Fry, as I've shown, are very small. So deeper and wider water courses also support larger fish, some of them uh, non-native and predatory, like uh, some of the uh, sunfish, black crappie, possibly bass, but also the major predator of salmon fry in the spring are things like uh, larger cutthroat trout, but particularly pike minnow. All throughout the Fraser at this time of year, you'll see the pike minnow, the larger ones, they might be 30, 40 centimeters in length, predating on the small salmon fry. So again, uh, the small tidal channels were not part of the design uh, phase in 2009. But again, does it have value for Harrison River Chinook? I would say yes. Does it have value for coho salmon? I would say yes, particularly the coho salmon juveniles, which would like the deeper water. Okay, another design feature well, before we leave this square, there's a pond outside of the dike right beside the, the Coquitlam River. Just to flag it, what that was meant to do is during the various tidal cycles is these little Chinook fry, particularly Chinook fry and coho juveniles in the fall, are seeking areas outside of the main flow the hope was they would collect in that pond. And when the tide gates did open, allowing them access on an incoming tide to Wilson Farm, you may have collected juvenile over, juveniles over a number of cycles that then would move through the culverts. Sometimes juveniles take a while to decide that they will go through a culvert. It's a dark place and from a little fish, a dark confined space is a dangerous space. So that is one of the issues getting fish through uh, culverts. I know I live on the Salmon River and was involved with the upgrade of the Salmon River pump house and they go through about an 18 inch or half a meter square orifice through a dark entrance and we sampled the Salmon River. They actually penetrate up to seven uh, kilometers upstream of the Salmon River even going through this tide gate. So they will go into these culverts. It just may take them a while to decide to do so. So that's what that pond's meant to do, to give them a little secure place that they can gather and then make a decision if they're gonna carry on into Wilson Farm. So the second area I just wanna flag is the red uh, area marked in red. 
that was a, a deeper channel for them. There may have been some wood placed, but that was primarily tar targeted these wintering coho juveniles. And the reason it was placed up there is the thought there may be some groundwater seeps coming from uh, Colony Farm, or not Colony Farm, Mary Hill, along the base of the hill there, that might just provide some better water quality for wintering juveniles and allow them to stay there a little longer in the spring as things warmed up. Again, juvenile sampling, I'm not certain if that was successful. That was the decision of the design team from the compensation group that did this final design, but that was the idea. That was more targeted at coho juveniles spending the winter, and the one in yellow was partic particularly targeted uh, Chinook fry just for that February to May period. Secondarily, the other species, as I said, Chinook and Chum fry do rear in these estuary tidal habitats. So that's what we have. I just want to hi highlight uh, two species um, that we, or I didn't identify in those key species in those original sketches back in 209. And I really think they cannot be underestimated. You literally have to view these as a key species you're designing for. So they can be compatible to the other species and the other values you want for the park beavers. You create aquatic habitat in our part of the world, beavers will use it. So you have to really think about where plants are, what types of plants, and the fact that beavers will be there. I mean, the last thing we want in parks is to be able to have to manage physically uh, disturb beavers. We'd re it much more productive to design features that are compatible with beavers' presence, but we don't promote things like beaver dams, which really is not particularly compatible for things like tidal channels. So I just wanted to go back to that little sketch that I provided to the work groups back in 209 just to, to look at some of the concepts that we've talked about, because it was in the sketch. So the little dendritic channels are in, typically were in the lower, lower elevation areas first. Um, that's the lighter greens. But also you'll notice there's little circles with a dot. Those are shrub uh, islands, but they were specifically meant to be set back from the channel, not to provide, and, and it was done to provide bird habitat, small bird habitat primarily in the fields without providing forage material or dam building material to beavers. And I think that's something we'll, we'll discuss because designing for beavers is critical to make these areas work long-term for fish habitat. So we'll talk a little bit about not just where you put shrubs in terms of these aquatic environments, but also perhaps what, what plants we could use to reduce the likelihood beavers will use them for dam building material. So this is from my direct observation around restoration projects I've worked on for many, many years. I live on the Salmon River, and in the 90s, we did a lot of planting along the Salmon River. The Salmon River is uh, uh, tidally affected. The lower Salmon River is tidally affected. Uh, heavily reed canary grass affected. Uh, blackberries are somewhat common, uh, but a good and healthy beaver population that moves up and down this river. So this is my sense. When I have seen plantings of conifers along beaver areas, typically they often focus on cedars because they're known as tolerating wet soils, a very high value tree. But I also have noticed that beavers will specifically target and take down cedar trees. They don't seem to eat them. They don't seem to have put them in dams particularly. They just take them down probably because they're adapted uh, to take these conifers down that have very little value to them as a food source and it, I call it the slash and burn agriculture gene they take the big trees down so the little stuff grows that they do eat the willows willows and young cottonwood so cedar trees 
aren't a resinous conifer, and I think that's the difference. Now, in contrast, what I've noticed is the resinous con conifers seem to be largely left alone. But I will say, if I planted any tree that I wanted to stand for 100 plus years, I would put at least a meter wide, heavy galvanized uh, uh, circle of wire around them. So it could last for at least 50 years till that tree gets to a sizable size. My favorite tree, if you want elevation, is grand fir. And I have over a hundred year one in front of my house. Very resinous, uh, very tolerant of wetland. It's common along streams. It's not particularly common um, in, in plant communities just because it, for whatever reason, it's a relatively rare stream. But, but when we've planted it, we notice beer, beavers avoid it. It's likely because it's so reven, re, resinous. Now, a more common uh, uh, conifer plant, and you'll see it through the colony farm projects, is Sitka spruce. They do very well. And in heavy beaver areas, the beavers walk around them. They don't seem to take them down. And in terms of a shrub and a dense shrub for cover, they're a great plant. But if you did want any elevation, I've noticed many of the Sitka spruce uh, suffer from the spruce budworm and they really suffer, they really uh, struggle to get elevation. So if you want some elevation, I would su suggest Grand Fir uh, and Survival and Sitka spruce is a good one if, if you don't mind smaller, uh, smaller trees that just will be slower growing. And then the third one is shore pine that if you look on the colony farm just to the north and First Nations Reserve number one, Coquitlam number one, I think shore pine was quite common. Again, it's very resinous, and I think that's partly why it, they can coexist with beavers. They just do not want to chew these things full of resin. So anyway, those are three conifers to consider, different reasons too. Now, going down the list, we know we have blackberries, so taller sometimes is better with blackberries. So the next tree living on the Salmon River, <clears throat> what you notice is the alders can only survive on an outside bend where there's a near vertical bank and they germinate on that vertical bank. It's because the beaver can't stand to chew them down. It just can't set itself. So they survive only on one bank. On the inside bank, the low elevation bank of the curves, you see black hawthorn. They're the ones that largely survive. I've seen them uh, chewed by beavers, but they don't seem to use them for food. So they periodically take them down it might be young beavers but not in a great amount they get quite tall they're a good wildlife to provide a berry so i like the black hawthorn in heavy beaver areas same thing with pacific crab apple uh, they're not that common again these are rare rare -er plants i think for diversity they're great plants again they grow quite tall i've seen them closer to the ocean along the dikes on crescent beach and out uh, at the mouth of the estuary. They seem to be in uh, beaver zones and not particularly targeted. So I think they're another one for diversity at least. Um, the one, if you go to Colony Farm, it's quite noticeable in the fields is red alder, elderberry does do very well. So there's a wildlife, they're a reasonably large tall shrub that seems to get just high enough that they be, be able to outgrow the blackberries in, in many instances. Uh, so I think they're another survivor. And again, I just want to flag, if you want to know what plants survive around beavers, often go through a heavy beaver area and just sort of watch the ones that have survived. Now, another one that I really like because along the Fraser River, they're a large shrub. They provide a seed. They have a lot of wildlife values. Um, is nine bark, relatively tall. They can go get quite tall, five, six, seven meters. Uh, create more of a, a clump, clump growth. And I notice the beavers don't touch them. I don't know why, but nine bard is a real winner in, in my world for a large shrub in beaver country. Now in the Squamish estuary, I noticed the black twinberry is very common in, again in beaver areas. So black twinberry is not as tall and it would not do as well against beavers. Nutka rose, for obvious reasons, is not used for building dams. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. It creates these thickets and these uh, uh, grows by rhizomes. So I really like Nutka Rose. I used to suggest that along agricultural di ditches if people didn't want plants that got too high. In blackberries, if you get our native Nutka Rose, they will fight for the light. They, they could go four meters high. Uh, 
the ones that I planted along my river bank and they have to fight the blackberries and I do a little bit of management blackberries I notice the nicker rose pop out and and survive maybe not thrive under a direct blackberry attack but they do survive now the last three are only really suitable for areas without a lot of blackberry because they're smaller salmonberry I think struggle out in direct sunlight but they're such a uh, interesting wildlife plant beautiful plant thimbleberry and snowberry so maybe areas that um, islands of spoil that could be put in places like Wilson Farm, surrounded by reed canary grass meadows, and then blackberries literally taken out until the, um, they've established a total cover of an area. These areas, uh, these plants, I think. What I notice though is beavers again don't feed on them and they don't use them for dam building materials. So that's 12 plants that I would argue if you could plant them in clumps and uh, along lines. Ideally, uh, more than a beaver wants to go from water comfortably because they don't provide a lot of food resources. There's like, less likely that beaver is even going to go go there and try to cut them down just to, just because. So setting them back from the water's edge. Ideas from Wilson Farm worth to consider. So there's some discussion of doing further work on Wilson Farm. So here is some concepts uh, given what we've learned to date and some of the things we've discussed. I think it would be worth to investigate reopening some existing uh, ditches, uh, similar to the concept I proposed back in 209. I've identified three. Uh, sharp edge on one side, perhaps. Uh, you could decide if you wanted to leave machine access. So a steep edge on one side and the deeper part of the channel on that side. Assuming that reed canary grass would grow on that side and shade and hang over the deeper edge. The deeper edge is the refuge area for small fish at low tide. And then a very broad uh, bench, maybe five meters wide on one side, going from low water elevation up to, you know, half a meter or more above low water. It would be inundated at most tidal cycles, but at low tide it would be exposed with the idea that that bench would promote a whole diverse uh, community of wetland plants, not just reed canary grass. <clears throat> so if you did that, that's a relatively simple and non-disruptive of the field environment for people that were wanted to move into this slowly. And then building on the pre-existing uh, habitats that were constructed for Harrison Chinook Fry, and I should say, I would recommend all the habitats from on this project on the north field of Wilson Farm be those shallow water tidal habitats. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the idea is the deep water habitats are largely there. They've been created by the perimeter ditches and the previous works. What we really want is these shallow water habitats. So I've shown some dendritic channels again, just in concept, but they literally try to stay away from existing shrub uh, accumulations they go around them again trying to sort of not promote beaver activity now for that spoil could be used to have selective uh, placement of shrub edge sh uh, shrub areas but again at the very top ends of the channels and set back somewhat from the channels not to promote beaver dams in these habitats and we'll talk a little bit more about that again I want to go back to this idea of shallow habitats I didn't talk as much about it, but the last half of the re rearing period, so juveniles have come in to these habitats maybe as early, Chinook juveniles, as early as March 1st. But from my studies on the Sam River, the peak in migration week was the first week of April. So you really only have from the majority of fish have, let's say, from April 1 to before the Fraser freshet comes on or temperatures rise. So let's say mid May. So there's a six week critical period. So the longer you can keep these habitats in, for instance, the Wilson Farm cool enough to um, keep these cool water species happy, the more productive it'll be for things like Harrison River Chinook Fry. So with deeper channels, what I've observed in other projects, if you think about it, when the tide comes in, those channels have been sitting with water in them, absorbing solar energy, even at low tide. 
and that volume of water is then pushed upstream during the tidal cycle. So often it can be quite warm. So the idea of a uh, more shallow habitat is it largely drains during the low tide cycle. It doesn't have a reservoir of water to heat up. And that's water that has to be replenished at the high tide cycle. So the more of this shallow water areas, these swales, I'll call them with a little bit of deep water in them, you create, it just means more water will have to come through that tide gate on each tidal cycle, which will drive the temperatures down in the deeper habitats and even into the tidal channel habitats. So it's the idea is we want to create um, a greater volume of flow to freshen and cool that water for that critical last part of the rearing habitat uh, phase for particularly this Harrison River Chinook from about mid-April to mid-May is the critical time when oxygens and temperatures conspire to push them out of these habitats. So by creating more of these shallow areas that almost fully drain during low tidal cycles, we can push back on that heating, heating period. Now, in many springs, we don't get our warm water weather before mid-May. But some years we do roughly around May 1st. So that last two weeks, uh, these tidal channels, these shallow tidal channels could really help with that. So that's the concept and some ideas to think about. So just following up on some of these design ideas I just discussed in the previous slide. So if you reactivated these ditches, then those fields would become drier, which should help vole communities, that idea. The ditches also for, could provide good habitat for Harrison River Chinook fry. So the little red dots are spoil areas that you, or plant areas that you could either put spoil and create these shrub areas or tree areas in the field to make more diverse plant communities. But again, the idea of keeping away from the, the, the channel edges. Now the, uh, the open channel on the right I showed in the previous slide just reopening the two perimeter ditches. But if you wanted to build habitat in a phased way, perhaps cross ditches could be created that would provide drainage and passage for fish. And then in the field, the dendritic channels could again be created. And the idea is the spoil could be moved to the top end and then planted with trees that you want to. The next ditch, in a, so this could be done over a series of years as funds became available. So you do it in these sort of paddocks with the idea that you'd work your way down the field, make sure your other values were being protected. A couple things, all the ditches that are straight also provide access for machine access. You could leave machine access areas there. So the cross ditches, for instance, you could have a machine access mower, for instance, that could get to those shrub areas in red. Uh, for maintaining blackberries or mowing grasses, those sorts of things. So it's the, the straight lines provide those access corridors, the dendritic provides the fish habitat and the spoil provides the shrub meadow uh, opportunities to plant trees that may not want to live in a flat field as well. They'd rather some raised ground, perhaps some of the conifers for instance. So again, over time, that field could be developed as, as somebody gets a grant or a compensation requirement. If you liked what you got in that field, I just chose that field because it, it seemed to be um, you know, somewhat open. There was other shrubs in other fields. But that idea that you could phase this and slowly transform colony form and learn as you go to maximize all the values that you want from the farm. So that's the concept I'm promoting, building on the past habitat works on the left, and then opening up a new field with these concepts of revisiting our old drainage ditch system, add some more naturalized features, add some plant community features, see how the beavers react and move consistently and slowly and learn. So just some last thoughts. I think we all know that the coming century is going to be challenging. There's going to be, they predict uh, many changes in the environment. And species like salmon are already under pressure and will appear to have uh, significant pressures ahead. Even with sea level rise, some of our marshes at the uh, uh, lower end of the Fraser Estuary will be challenged. They'll be inundated and these uh, 
these habitats along the Fraser River corridor for species like Chinook salmon for their small fish in the spring will become more and more valuable. Even Colony Farm, it's a diked property. It's effectively below high tide. Uh, we'll see what the next century builds, but it's likely there's going to be pressures. It's going to become more aquatic, likely, just because of these processes due to sea level rise. So perhaps we can start thinking about how to get these fi fish a little more uh, friendly habitat in the park and design features for our other values. So hopefully we face the next century with a very complex park that supports all these values, including these slimy, cold things called salmon. <laughs>